how about putting some real silver in your loved one's stockings this year? That's right, because now through December 21st, for every $5,000 you spend with Birch Gold Group on physical gold or silver or investing in your precious metals IRA, Birch Gold will send you bonus silver. It's the countdown to inauguration day, a great time to solidify your savings through diversification. Here's what you need to do. Text NEWT to 474747. And when you speak to your Birch Gold representative, let them know you want the free silver with your purchase. Even if you are investing in a precious metals IRA, you'll still get the physical silver delivered to your door. Text NEWT to 474747. Get a free info kit on diversifying into gold from Birch Gold. They have an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau and countless five-star reviews. Text NEWT to 474747 and open a precious metals IRA and get your free silver before December 21st. In a world of an ever-changing economic landscape, how on earth can I get some financial stability in my life? I'm David Grosso, host of the podcast, Follow the Profit. Every week, you'll hear from successful entrepreneurs to learn from their achievements, and most importantly, to avoid their mistakes. On the podcast, you'll hear stories that will deconstruct what's going on in the economy and how it's affecting your finances so that you can follow the profit. Listen to Follow the Profit every Saturday on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Hi, this is Newt. Due to the virus, I'm recording from home, so you may notice a difference in audio quality. On this episode of Newt's World, I want to talk about the 1776 opportunity and the idea that in 2026, on the 250th anniversary, we really ought to spend the year celebrating the extraordinary breakthroughs that made America an exceptional country and that is still at the heart of our freedom, our sense of liberty, and our identity as Americans, no matter where we come from. You can come from anywhere on the planet and become an American. It's a remarkable system. And in many ways, it's worth really studying what happened. How did our ancestors somehow put together this amazing, continuously evolving, but continuously free system? So I want to start first by talking about the history of the Declaration of Independence, why it's so important, and why I think that it's well worthwhile to think about spending an entire year driving it home, celebrating it, exploring it in 2026. Gradually, the British colonists found themselves going through a conversation that really began probably in the 1760s. They had been very loyal and they had frankly been in the shadow of Great Britain because as long as the French owned Canada, they had a great power right next to them, which in alliance with various Native American tribes was a mortal threat. Up until the Seven Years' War, which we called the French and Indian War, they really were very, very supportive of Britain because they needed the British Navy and they needed the British Army and they needed financial support in times of war. All of a sudden in 1763, the French are gone. They've lost the war. They've given up Canada. And now the Americans don't have a major threat to force them into the arms of Great Britain. And so now, finding themselves relatively safe and not needing a defender, they begin to pay more attention to how the British govern. And they begin to decide, you know, I'm not sure I'm very happy with this. London has all the power. I have a voice in my local colony where I vote and I elect somebody. For example, in Virginia, they elect the people to go to the House of Burgesses. But all the real power is in London, and I don't have much ability to do much about it. And so you see in the 1760s and early 1770s, a gradual psychological migration by which at least a third of the American colonists decided we really need to break our ties with England because they're not listening to us, they're exploiting us, they're trying to raise our taxes, and so forth. 
By May 15th of 1776, this had all developed enough, and every time the British would react with force, the Americans would get madder. Once in 1775, you had the British send out armed forces to Lexington and Concord in Massachusetts to try to seize the armory of the guns and the ammunition. That was a disaster because there was a trained and independent militia, and they actually defeated the British, forced them back into Boston. Then they fought the Battle of Bunker Hill. And by that point, all of the other colonies began to decide, hey, there's going to be a fight between Massachusetts and London. I'm on the side of Massachusetts. And so that expressed itself in a Continental Congress, which met first in 1775, bringing the other people from all 13 colonies, and really begin to talk about, so what are we going to do? Well, by May 15th of 1776, the Virginia Convention instructed its deputies to offer the following motion, quote, that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states. What a revolutionary moment this is. They're sending their delegation, which will include people like Thomas Jefferson and George Washington. And they're supposed to go to Philadelphia, to the Continental Congress. By June 7th, Richard Henry Lee of Virginia is reading the resolution to Congress at the Pennsylvania State House. And you have it being seconded by one of the leading advocates in Massachusetts, John Adams. And the resolution Richard Henry Lee read said, resolved, that these United Colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown, and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved. Now, the Congress is going to recess for three weeks, and they postponed voting on it because New York in particular wanted to go home and find out from their assembly back home, what do you think? But before they left for three weeks, they appointed a committee of five, John Adams of Massachusetts, Benjamin Franklin of Pennsylvania, Thomas Jefferson of Virginia, Roger Sherman of Connecticut, and Robert Livingston of New York. This committee of five was appointed to compose the Declaration of Independence. About 17 days later, on June 28th, Jefferson submits his rough draft of the Declaration. Over the next two days, Congress debated and made extensive changes, despite Jefferson's objection. Jefferson, he was unhappy that people wanted to change his language. He was actually much tougher about the slave trade, and the Southerners were not prepared to go that far. Ben Franklin, who was the oldest person there, and I think in many ways the wisest, tried to reassure Jefferson by telling him a story about a merchant whose storefront sign said, John Thompson, hatter, makes and sells hats for ready money. After his friends offered criticism, the sign instead read, John Thompson, above a picture of a hat. And he was trying to tell him it's okay for it to be shorter. On July the 1st, John Adams from Massachusetts addresses the Congress in a moving speech supporting the Declaration of Independence. This is Adams, who in many ways, I think, is undervalued as an extraordinary leader who did so much to shape America. Quote, whatever may be our fate, be assured that this declaration shall stand. It may cost treasure and it may cost blood, but it will stand and it will richly compensate for both. Through the thick gloom of the present, I see the brightness of the future as the sun in heaven. We shall make this a glorious and immortal day. When we are in our graves, our children will honor it. They will celebrate it with thanksgiving, with festivity, with bonfires, with illuminations. On its annual return, they will shed tears, copious gushing tears, not of subjection and slavery, but of exaltation, of gratitude, and of joy. Sir, before God, I believe the hour has come. My judgment approves this measure, and my whole heart is in it. All that I have, and all that I am, and all that I hope in this life. I am now ready here to take upon it, and I leave off as I begun, that live or die, survive or perish. I am for the Declaration. It is my living sentiment, 
and by the blessing of God, it shall be my dying sentiment. Independence now and independence forever. That gives you some sense of the depth. These people understood what they were doing. They were taking on the most powerful empire in the world. The British had just defeated the French. They were unrivaled in their capacity to raise money. Their navy was the most powerful on the planet. They could hire plenty of mercenary soldiers from Germany. And here are these guys sitting in Philadelphia going, you know, I just got to do it. I have no choice. So on the 2nd of July, the Lee Resolution for Independence was adopted by 12 of the 13 colonies. New York again abstained. Immediately after, the Congress began to consider the Declaration of Independence. On July 3rd, Adams wrote to his wife, Abigail, who's, I think, one of the most interesting women of the era, very intelligent, very well informed. Her letters to John and his answers are remarkable. So John writes his wife, quote, the second day of July, 1776, will be the most memorable epoch in the history of America. I'm apt to believe that it will be celebrated by succeeding generations as the great anniversary festival. It ought to be commemorated as the day of deliverance by solemn acts of devotion to God Almighty. It ought to be solemnized with pomp and parade, with shows, games, sports, guns, bells, bonfires, and illuminations from one end of this continent to the other from this time forward forevermore. And on the 4th of July, the Declaration of Independence was officially adopted. This is Gianno Caldwell. This week on Out Loud with Gianno Caldwell, I talked to the youngest member of the incoming Congress, and that is Congressman-elect Madison Cawthorn. Congressman-elect Cawthorn and I discussed the tragedy that shaped his life, how he expects to get along with his new colleagues, including AOC, his thoughts on legalizing cannabis, and what he expects the future of the GOP to look like. You don't want to miss this episode of Out Loud with Gianno Caldwell. Listen to Out Loud with Gianno Caldwell every Monday on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. How about putting some real silver in your loved one's stockings this year? That's right, because now through December 21st, for every $5,000 you spend with Birch Gold Group on physical gold or silver, or investing in your precious metals IRA, Birch Gold will send you bonus silver. It's the countdown to inauguration day, a great time to solidify your savings through diversification. Here's what you need to do. Text NEWT to 47 Four seven four seven, And when you speak to your Birch Gold representative, let them know you want the free silver with your purchase. Even if you are investing in a precious metals IRA, you'll still get the physical silver delivered to your door. Text NEWT to 474747. Get a free info kit on diversifying into gold from Birch Gold. They have an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau and countless five-star reviews. Text NEWT to 474747 and open a precious metals IRA and get your free silver before December 21st. You're going to come into a new season of joy and fulfillment like you've never seen. Hi, I'm Joel Osteen. I have a daily podcast where I talk about overcoming obstacles, accomplishing dreams, and becoming all you were created to be. You were made for more. You have new levels in you. There are seeds of greatness waiting to spring forth. You can't think negative thoughts and live a positive life. And on my daily podcast, I'll help you get your mind going in the right direction. You may have had some disappointments in the past, but this is a new day. Chains that have held you back are being broken. Doors are going to open that you never dreamed would open. Now do your part. Keep feeding your hopes, feeding your dreams. Don't use your energy to feed your history. Use your energy to feed your destiny. It's inspiring, uplifting, and encouraging. I think you'll like it. Listen to the Joel Osteen Podcast on the iHeartRadio. Video ad on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Now, on the 5th, although Congress had adopted the declaration, the Committee of Five's task wasn't complete. Congress now directed them to oversee the printing of the document. Remember, these guys are sitting in Philadelphia. They have an entire country, plus they have written this document in part to appeal to the French and the Dutch and the Spanish 
to try to draw them into helping against Great Britain. The first printed copies of the Declaration of Independence were turned out from the shop of John Dunlop, official printer to the Congress. Dunlop delivers 200 copies of the Declaration, which are now called Dunlap broadsides. One copy is officially entered into the Congressional Journal, and the other copies are distributed throughout the colonies. On July 6th, the Pennsylvania Evening Post becomes the first newspaper to reprint the whole declaration. But news of the July 2nd decision to declare independence has already been widely reported, and various celebrations and discussions are already taking place throughout the colonies. On that same day, July 6th, John Hancock wrote a letter to George Washington with an enclosed copy of the Declaration of Independence to be read to his troops. Remember, by this stage, Washington is the commanding general. He left the Continental Congress in 75, goes to Massachusetts so they can have a Virginia general leading an essentially New England army to begin to bind people together. It's a remarkable moment, and Washington understands the morale matters. That having your troops understand what they're fighting for and why it matters is really important. And the Declaration is written in part as propaganda. It's written to arouse, to excite, to win the argument, to have people say, yes, obviously that's what we should do. On the 8th of July, the Declaration is read publicly to the people of Philadelphia. And around this time, Congress gets around to sending a copy to its emissary in Europe to be distributed to all the European governments. Sadly, the original letter is lost. And the Declaration is informally delivered to Great Britain and the rest of Europe until November when news of the Declaration had already reached Europe, but the exact language had not. So finally, on July 9th, New York finally got around to saying, okay, yes, we've been told we should approve it. So they now had all 13 colonies approving with New York's Home Assembly finally authorizing them to vote yes. On July 19th, Congress orders that the Declaration be engrossed on parchment with the title, the unanimous declaration of the 13 United States of America. And notice, they've moved from the colonies to the United States of America, and that it be signed by every member of Congress. Hancock, who is the president of Congress, signs the engrossed copy, followed by most of the other delegates. So now, we have the background. Why did it really matter so much? Why do I think the July 2026, on the 250th anniversary, should be a central moment in reigniting American patriotism and an American understanding of what this country is all about. So I think that it's very important to understand how the people who wrote this understood that this was a central moment in history. It's a central moment because They've written a Declaration of Independence, which is a moral document. It says, we are endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights, among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It outlines and makes the case that when the king acts against the subjects, the subjects have the right to change the king. This is extraordinary revolutionary concepts of breaking down the entire structure of power, which had defined Europe for most of the last several thousand years. And they knew that it was that important. John Adams writes to his wife, Abigail, on the 3rd of July and says, you will think me transported with enthusiasm, but I am not. I am well aware of the toil and blood and treasure that it will cost us to maintain this declaration and support and defend these states. Yet through all the gloom, I can see the ray of ravishing light and glory. I can see that the end is more than worth all the means. Now, almost a generation later, Jefferson and Adams are among the last survivors of that great Congress. On September 1st, 1821, Jefferson writes Adams, who, by the way, have been real competitors and in some ways real opponents of each other. Jefferson writes, the flames kindled on the 4th of July, 1776, have spread over too much of the globe to be extinguished by the feeble engines of despotism. On the contrary, they will consume these engines and all who work them. A few days before his death in 1826, Jefferson wrote a letter to Roger Whiteman on the 50th anniversary of declaring independence. And Jefferson writes, quote, may it be to the world what I believe it will be, to some part sooner 
to others later, but finally to all. The signal of arousing men to burst the chains under which monkish ignorance and superstition had persuaded them to bind themselves and to assume the blessings and security of self-government. That form, which we have substituted, restores the free right to the unbounded exercise of reason and freedom of opinion. All eyes are opened or opening to the rights of man. Jefferson's hope was captured by Frederick Douglass, the great African-American orator who is probably the leading spokesperson in the black community of the 19th century, who advocated the end of slavery and who was widely received both in the North and in Europe as a visionary. Frederick Douglass, in a 4th of July speech in 1852, says, quote, the signers of the Declaration of Independence were brave men. They were great men, too great enough to give frame to a great age. It does not often happen to a nation to raise at one time such a number of truly great men. The point from which I'm compelled to view them is not certainly the most favorable. And yet, I cannot contemplate their great deeds with less than admiration. They were statesmen, patriots, and heroes. And for the good they did, and the principles they contended for, I will unite with you to honor their memory. So he's saying this, by the way, in the context of saying, look, slavery still exists. They failed to eliminate slavery. I can't be 100% in favor of them, but they've set the stage for the argument to eliminate slavery. And I have to respect how much courage they did show in moving as far as they did. Abraham Lincoln, in a letter to Henry Pierce, written on April 6, 1859, called the Declaration of Independence, quote, a rebuke and a stumbling block to the very harbingers of reappearing tyranny and oppression. Remember, this is a beginning taste of where Lincoln's going, because Lincoln was very anti-slavery, and Lincoln ultimately wraps the entire explanation of America back to the Declaration of Independence. For most of the period after 1789, it was not the Declaration of Independence, but the Constitution, which had been sort of the central document. But with Lincoln showing up, Lincoln decides that the explanation for why the North is in favor of freedom has to be built around the Declaration of Independence. And so he, in a sense, brings it back and makes it the centerpiece of explaining America. In the I Have a Dream speech, Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. said, quote, when the architects of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, they were signing a promissory note to which every American was to fall heir. This note was a promise that all men would be guaranteed the inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. In other words, even the critics who understood that it hadn't solved everything, that it wasn't perfect, understood there was such a gigantic leap in the right direction, and it was so clearly establishing the moral framework, which would allow us to have the other arguments to continue to expand freedom that they continually come back to what remarkable people these were and what a remarkable document the Declaration was. Hi, this is Rob Smith, and I'm Problematic. As a black gay Republican, I don't fit into any neat boxes. And because of that, I'm problematic to the political left, which wants me to stay quiet and do what I'm told. But I'm not about that, because no one owns me. The left can't divide us with identity politics. But I'm also problematic to the right, because being problematic is about thinking for yourself and being your own person. Come be problematic with me. Listen to Rob Smith is Problematic every Tuesday on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm David Grosso, host of the podcast Follow the Profit. Now, I'm not talking about profit in the biblical sense. I'm talking about entrepreneurs who follow the profit and how they're making it work in business and sharing those exact lessons with you. The world, of course, is constantly changing, and many of you are seeking some sort of financial stability. Well, this podcast is not some get-rich-quick motivational show. This podcast is designed for you to discover how to use your money to help you. Every week, you're going to hear from successful entrepreneurs to learn about their achievements, but most importantly, to avoid their mistakes. On the podcast, you're also going to hear stories that will deconstruct what's going on in the economy and how those developments affect your finances. 
Economic stability, of course, is something that we're all seeking, and I'm going to tell you how to get closer to your dreams so that you can follow the profit. Listen to Follow the Profit every Saturday on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. When you start thinking about the 250th anniversary in 2026, there are really, I think, three big reasons to have a 250th anniversary celebration. First, this is an opportunity to drive home the core principles of American exceptionalism. The Declaration of Independence is at the heart of the American sense of individual authority and responsibility. Remember, the Declaration says that you personally are endowed by your creator with certain unalienable rights, among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So it creates a central framework in which every American is exceptional, and every American has their rights come from God. Second, at the national level, this celebration can become a significant enough event that it can be developed into an immersive experience for the American people to reconnect with American history. This gives us an opportunity by building it around the 250th anniversary to get every American to look at the extraordinary importance of the Declaration of Independence and the extraordinary importance of the American commitment to freedom and to the rule of law. Third, in addition to educating Americans and focusing Americans, the 250th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence is a tremendous opportunity to communicate to the entire world the extraordinary difference in moral authority and human freedom between the American system and the Chinese communist totalitarian efforts to control everyone and everything. There can be no greater contrast between the tyranny of Xi Jinping and the Chinese communist dictatorship and the grant of freedom, the assertion of your rights. The government doesn't give you freedom, God does. The government doesn't give you rights, God does. And that, by the way, is why We need to have a very big national dialogue about redefining freedom, given the mess that governors and mayors and others have made of infringing on our constitutional liberties, using the excuse of COVID to impose the most petty and stupid rules. It's pretty useful for us to take the Declaration of Independence and from it, the Bill of Rights, and remind people, this is a country built around protecting citizens from government. It's not a country built in which citizens are supposed to be subordinate to government. And I think that this 250th anniversary could be a great opportunity to recenter the system. Now, I also think, frankly, it's a great way to contrast the real history of America with the project the New York Times launched, what they called their 1619 project. They were pretty open about their ambitions. They said the 1619 project goal is, quote, to reframe American history by considering what it would mean to regard 1619 as our nation's birth year. Doing so requires us to place the consequences of slavery and the contributions of black Americans at the very center of the story we tell ourselves about who we are as a country. Now, I do think that it's very important to understand the unique experiences of the African-American community. I think it's very important to understand the degree to which slavery was totally wrong and the degree to which it created a frame of reference for African-Americans totally different from that for other Americans. But I think that that is a piece of the American fabric. It's not the American fabric. And I think that a 1619 project, which attempted to get us to integrate the experiences of African-Americans with the larger story of America, would make perfect sense. But a 1619 project, which wants to eliminate the larger story in favor of a very narrowly defined story, I think is a huge mistake and one which the 250th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence could truly help us explain. I'm not by myself in this. Brett Stevens, who's a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, wrote about the 1619 project, quote, as fresh concerns make clear on these points, and for all its virtues, buzz, spinoffs, and a Pulitzer Prize, the 1619 Project has failed. That doesn't mean that the project seeks to erase the Declaration of Independence from history. 
but it does mean that it seeks to dethrone the 4th of July by treating American history as a story of black struggle against white supremacy, of which the Declaration is, for all of its high flown rhetoric, supposed to be merely a part. Close quote. Alan Guelzo, a great Civil War historian, in a city journal essay about the New York Times project, said, quote, the 1619 project aspires through essays, poems, and short fiction to rewrite entirely the narrative of American slavery, not as an unwilling inheritance of British colonialism, but as the love object of American capitalism from its very origins. It reviews slavery not as a blemish that the founders grudgingly tolerated with the understanding that it must soon evaporate, but as the prize that the Constitution went out of its way to secure and protect. The Times presents slavery not as a regrettable chapter in the distant past, but as the living, breathing pattern upon which all American social life is based, world without end. Guelzo went on to say that the New York Times 1619 Project is essentially projecting a conspiracy theory. He says, quote, again, the 1619 Project is not history. It is conspiracy theory. And like all conspiracy theories, the 1619 Project announces with the Eureka that it has acquired the explanation to everything and thus gives an aggrieved audience a sense that finally it is in control through its understanding of the real cause of its unhappiness. As a way of reconnecting every American, I'm suggesting that we think about a year-long project for 2026 to really study, celebrate, understand, and rediscuss the centrality of the Declaration of Independence. We ought to start now developing month by month a year-long plan so that we could truly communicate and experience and talk about and come to understand the great lessons of how the Declaration of Independence was conceived, how it was written, what they meant by, and what it means to us today. And I think a year in 2026 of doing that would just be remarkably impactful. And it would set the stage because in 2032, we're going to be celebrating the 300th anniversary of George Washington's birth. The 200th anniversary, by the way, which took place in 1932, was a major nationwide celebration because he was truly the father of our country and the great, absolutely irreplaceable statesman on whose shoulders we still stand. Then in 2037, We're going to have the 250th anniversary of the drafting of the Constitution. And in 2041, we're going to celebrate the 250th anniversary of the adoption of the Bill of Rights, which is vital both for Americans and for people throughout the world. And it's important to recognize that the Bill of Rights was designed to limit government's ability to interfere with the individual's freedom. It's a key to understanding the American system. You can read more about the 250th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence and read my president's essay for the Heritage Foundation on our show page at newtsworld.com. Newt's World is produced by Gingrich 360 and iHeartMedia. Our executive producer is Debbie Myers. Our producer is Garnsey Sloan. And our researcher is Rachel Peterson. The artwork for the show was created by Steve Penley. Special thanks to the team at Gingrich 360. Please email me with your questions at gingrich360.com slash questions. I'll answer a selection of questions in future episodes. If you've been enjoying Newt's World, I hope you'll go to Apple Podcasts and both rate us with five stars and give us a review so others can learn what it's all about. I'm Newt Gingrich. This is Newt's World. into a new season of joy and fulfillment like you've never seen. Hi, I'm Joel Osteen. I have a daily podcast where I talk about overcoming obstacles, accomplishing dreams, and becoming all you were created to be. You may have had some disappointments in the past, but this is a new day. Keep feeding your hopes, feeding your dreams. Use your energy to feed your destiny. Listen to the Joel Osteen Daily Podcast on the iHeartRadio app or wherever you get your podcasts. In a world of an ever-changing economic landscape, how on earth can I get some financial stability in my life? 
I'm David Grosso, host of the podcast, Follow the Profit. Every week, you'll hear from successful entrepreneurs to learn from their achievements, and most importantly, to avoid their mistakes. On the podcast, you'll hear stories that will deconstruct what's going on in the economy and how it's affecting your finances so that you can follow the profit. Listen to Follow the Profit every Saturday on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.